Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pragmatic Podcast. I'm here with Sanjay Srivastava. Did I get that right? That's right, Michael. All right. The Chief Digital Officer at GenPact. So, Sanjay, maybe just to start things off, I'll let you introduce yourself a little and tell folks a little bit about your background and what it is that you do at GenPact. Thank you, Michael, uh, for having me here, and thanks for tuning in for this discussion. My name is Sanjay Srivastava. I am the Chief Digital Officer for GenPact. GenPact is a large global provider of professional services for digital transformation. We serve large Fortune 500 clients across the globe, and I run our businesses in automation, in analytics, in artificial intelligence, and in digital experience. And very happy to be here today. And uh, my background's uh, before Genpact uh, is that I was a startup entrepreneur here in Silicon Valley, and I built uh, a number of startup companies, all in high tech. And uh, I've been at the company the last uh, few years. We've been transforming who we are ourselves and transforming our company from having been originally in the past a business process management company to now a digital transformation company. Mm. And then more importantly, I work with clients and help them transform their corporations. Oh, wow, wonderful. And just deviating off script a little, what do you think uh, is your favorite Silicon Valley startup experience story? What was the company you worked on that you were most excited about? Well, that's very interesting. You know, um, I've had the opportunity to be in, in, a, in a four different startups that we created basically from scratch, and all of them have had great exits. Um, our first company was in what was now edge networking. Mm. Back then, we were playing with streaming media that was just trying to come out. We built a company around it um, that was acquired by Akamai. And mm. I stayed on Akamai and helped them build their enterprise business. And basically, um, you know, it helps get uh, applications at the edges of the internet. It's something that you and I use mm. without even thinking today. But back in the day, it was a very... Uh, innovative and new piece of capability that I think has changed the world since. Uh, our second company, my second startup was in the data center automation space. It became part of a cloud fabric. It's part of BMC's offering today. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, it allowed uh, our customers to scale as the cloud and internet grew and be able to manage the cost of operations around it. Um, our third company today, I would call it to be a predictive algorithms company. Mm. But back in the day, I don't think we used the term. Mm -hmm. And we built a company around that in the enterprise software space. So we sold it to SunGuard and became part of SunGuard's business um, for corporations. Um, I actually say that SunGuard ran um, uh, a number of uh, things with them around sales for a while around their international distribution. And I left and started a company which brought me to Genpact. And that was a software as a service, net native cloud application in the early days of SaaS. And we built it on top of force.com in close collaboration with Mark Benioff's uh, salesforce.com. Mm. And uh, eventually that company came to be acquired by Genpack, which is how I got here. So that's my story. Uh, and all of those experiences have been fantastic. And uh, they've been very different, uh, but they've been really, really fun. And but they've really highlighted your expertise in sort of digital transformation and kind of uh, these new technologies. And you're now focused on AI and you talk to corporate clients a lot, what do you see as the current state of adoption in AI for the enterprise? Well, it depends um, how you define the question. I tell you, um, I meet with boards of Fortune 500 companies, and I have to say that the top two questions that come up, uh, one of them is always around artificial intelligence and how does that change the future of work and what implications does it have for them to their employee base and their competitive environments. And so AI, the other question, by the way, is all around the experience economy. So those are, mm -hmm. those are two big questions that we come across all the time. And I think in the, in the context of AI, um, I would say that the um, interest engagement level uh, in Fortune 500 companies that we, uh, that we work with uh, is dramatically high. And, and I don't think I can name a company that isn't already talking about how do we implement artificial intelligence in the workplace, what's the right place to get started, what are the right problems to solve, and how do you pave the way? Uh, so that's one side of the equation. Look, the other side of the equation is a little different. I mean, the reality is AI has become very pervasive. And, mm. you know, I saw, I read last night that, um, uh, that, uh, 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 that neural net has actually painted a Picasso that had never been seen before. Mm -hmm. um, we know this year we, we, we basically discovered two new planets using artificial intelligence that we didn't even know about as mankind. Uh, 
you know, mm-hmm. across the spectrum from, you know, from arts to astronomy, from medicine. Uh, and you look at the work that's happening in medicine, where uh, in many areas of medicine, actually, AI is now performing humans, uh, you know, detection of pre-cervical cancer is a great example. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is AI is touching our uh, us in many different ways in our personal lives. And yet, I think... The, the flip side is when you look at enterprises, the reality is that there's significant opportunity and there's significant desire and need, but perhaps we haven't seen the same level of sort of throughput on AI that we've seen in other areas. And there are reasons for it, and we're working through the reasons. I think the industry as a whole is going to solve them eventually. Um, so I think that the, the fairest answer we can give to your question is interest level is super high uh, and desire to implement AI is uh, up at the top. Um, but it takes a lot of time to get these things off the ground. And so mm-hmm. the, the pull through rate, um, has a lot of opportunity for growth, but isn't hundred percent matching sort of the sentiment and the desire of the dog. So that brings me to my next question. What are the top challenges for AI adoption in the enterprise? Look, I mean, I think a number of things are pretty high on the list. Uh, the reality is bias and the whole topic of digital mm-hmm. ethics is large in the minds of boards and companies. Um, uh, to be able to work through. Um, the notion of explainability is a super important one, not only around regulated markets where it's actually a requirement, but also in just any business environment, the um, explainability is a large driver of adoption. And adoption is obviously key to success. But I'll tell you the number one thing beyond all of that, um, much higher on the list, is the fact that today it takes a long time and a lot of effort to get AI projects off the ground in the enterprise. And part of the reason behind that is, uh, you know, it's, you know, you can start with a horizontal AI engine, and many of those are now available, uh, etc. But the time it takes to tune that, the time it takes to um, to 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 make to customize that and contextualize that for the environment we're in um, is too long. And so the so the escape velocity comes too late in the game. The critical mass to get the AI project off the ground is required is very large. And by the time you discover an experiment and pilot and implement and industrialize and get it up and running and measure it, the total time to get return on investment is very high. And I think um, the industry is seeking ways of actually shortening that time and getting things off the ground faster. I think it's one of the uh, one of the top issues that uh, A, we need to solve and B, if we could solve, I think really accelerates deployments of AI in the enterprise. Oh, well, let's dive into each one of those in turn. So explainability and bias, clearly two very important issues in AI. Uh, it, what are the things, uh, what are, you know, I recently wrote a piece in Wired Magazine with the head of uh, the, the Allen Institute for AI here in Seattle talking about the need for auditing to combat bias uh, and the value of explainability. Do you think that message is getting through? And do you think that we, you know, what does it take to solve that problem on an enterprise scale? Well, I think explainability, to be honest, is a really well understood um, component for large corporations globally. Um, Clearly, we have clients in highly regulated markets where they have to go to the right level of uh, audit and review before they can actually productionalize new applications. And in those markets, it's pretty much a requirement. And then we have, I think most companies have gotten fairly wise to the notion of shelfware and failed IT projects. And so the, so the, so, so the, so the notion of, you know, what are the risks and explainable uh, is very high and explainability is, is crucial to adoption because if people don't sort of believe it, then they don't use it. And if they don't use it, then you don't get the returns you're looking to, to get it. And then look, I mean, Fundamentally, it's a hard problem to solve with AI because if you think about it, the reason AI is so successful at solving problems is because it's a change in paradigm in the way we program computers and software. And, mm-hmm. you know, we no longer do the what if then analysis and kind of write down all the what's and ifs and the thens and basically allow a computer to run it much faster in real time across the globe and in, uh, in parallel things that you know, human beings aren't able to do. Mm-hmm. And we've gotten all of this benefit on the back of that sort of approach. And yet, um, when you think about AI, it's fundamentally a very different approach. Where we're no longer telling the computer what if then. We're basically saying, here's the question, here's the answer. Let me tell that to you a million times around. And now go mm-hmm. program yourself. And, you know, simple change, really profound implication. And as a result of that, AI is now solving for the last mile, mile problems. But in turn, it can also end up, unfortunately, becoming a little bit of a black box. 
partly because you mm-hmm. can't actually do the what if dance and write it yes. out and show it in, 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 in principle. And so, you know, look, we struggled with this and, and I think we've solved the problem for the clients we serve. And one of the ways we've done that is, you know, um, instead of making it a big black box, you've got to be able to break it down into breadcrumbs and track back to the sources of decisions or insights. And 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 so I'll give you an example. You know, in the banking mm-hmm. industry, we serve clients, we help them manage risk in the portfolios for lending portfolios. And part of what that entails is being able to understand um, a portfolio of, let's say, 5,000 balance sheets, three different languages, two different accounting standards. And we have artificial intelligence applications that actually read through all of those, uh, ingest all the information, extract it, convert it into structured data, transform that into financial numbers, aggregate those numbers, weighted average it out, and then give you a, a score for the entire portfolio. This is what we used to do manually with uh, teams of CPAs and financial accountants. Now we do it with AI. Mm. But the way you design the application is you don't just give a final number and then say, trust me. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if you were on our application, you sort of, you, you could turn to me and say, Sanjay, I don't, I don't know if that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, my gosh, that number is high. And I'd say, you know, Mike, I'll just click on it. And you double, you click and it drills through to the next level of detail and shows you the component numbers. And you click on the fourth one because it doesn't sound right. And then it shows you the companies that it came from. And you click on the 18th one because that was clearly an outlier. Um, and now you click and drill through to the two pa- two sentences on page 19 of a balance sheet mm. that we extracted from, and it gives you the exact place, the exact two sentences that gives you know us the interpretation of a risk number that then subsequently got mixed and matched and aggregated into a much bigger number. And this click and drill, this ability to breadcrumb back, this, this ability to track mm. back the source, the individual two sentences that drove an insight that drove an input that drove the decision that drove a number. That's the, that's, you know, we realized is a way to design AI applications because when you do that, you know, I can go to a regulator, I can go to a client and I can take them back to exactly the same way, um, you know, it would be done today. Yeah. And that appears to be addressing this need for explainability in a way that I think it meets the requirements for the workforce. It meets the audit requirements. It helps with regulators and I think it's making AI more accessible in general as an application in the enterprise. I, I love this idea of click and drill. It makes so much sense. Uh, and I wish we'd see this with more uh, AI products that, um, that are being adopted. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about the acceleration of AI development. Uh, we were saying that maybe there is kind of a barrier that there that uh, it takes a little too long to do the machine learning and the, uh, and the AI insights. Uh, and that, that kind of slows down adoption at the enterprise. How do you use guys help your clients solve that problem? You know, we've turned to a, a, a trick uh, that has played out before in in previous uh, waves of technology innovation. And, and, you know, if you think about this notion of modularization, which is really big in our minds, um, modules uh, have proven to be an inflection point in the evolution of any technology graph. I mean, you go back to computers as an example, um, you know, we used to have computers that were big boxes and they came in one or two or three options, but that's the level of flexibility, at least when I was growing up, you know, I had um, on my, the first set of computers I worked on. And yet, you know, our, our children, uh, we, we, our preteen uh, teenagers at the time um, were buying chips off of eBay and integrating it in their own motherboards and mm-hmm. designing one in one case to design a, a gaming computer with high performance. Another one designed a streaming computer for broadcasting. It was just amazing to see that really the movement from large monolithic compute engines, compute computer systems, to this notion of modules of chips and motherboards and memory cards and GNUs and the ability to integrate them in a mix and match fashion mm. is really expanded. It's sort of, a, there's been an explosion in the, in the size of that industry and the use cases that it's been able to uh, pull together. And the other thing, by the way, on modularization is that modularization inherently changes the form factor. So, you know, I used to be a photographer mm-hmm. when I grew up. Many of us love photography. And, you know, in my own lifetime, photography changed from a science of chemistry to a science of, um, of mathematics, right? It means we went to digital photography. But what it also did is that modularization created a form factor where I could now, instead of printing a photograph and putting it into that hardbound album that I grew up with when I was a child, we're now able to integrate this into a Snapchat, into a into a Instagram to update the you know family at the end of the year at the Christmas letter to be able to include it in an email as an update from a business meeting, and you can see that modularization 
sort of expands the use case for how the technology gets used in, in ways that you, in some ways you can't even predict. Hmm. And so we're of the mindset that, you know, instead of designing AI systems as large monolithic sort of big chunky things, the way to approach this is to think about chips on a motherboard, to think about Lego Lego blocks on a, on a board. And, and so this notion of accelerators or pre-trained AI, and I'll come to pre-trained in a minute, but pre-trained AI accelerators that can be mix and match to address a value chain. Mm. Uh, fundamentally, what it does is it allows you to reduce the time it takes to get things off the ground. And, and do you, can see, yourself, these, do you yeah. see those pre-trained excel, uh, AI accelerators out there? Uh, these, these kind of AI modules? Yeah, we do. We, uh, we have uh, over 50 now that are up and running in a variety of client environments. And, you know, we just spent a minute on what a pre-trained AI accelerator is because it is a new term in the industry. And, and really what we're talking about is if you take a step back and think about what does it take for AI to be um, effective? And by effective, I mean have a prediction accuracy that is going to be appropriate for the business environment we're in. And if you, and if you look at that, um, what's coming through is that if you use a large-scale AI platform, and these are increasingly commodity and they're available mm. as a service now, and throw that into a commercial business environment, you're not going to get the prediction level, the prediction accuracy, even remotely close to what you need. And, you know, it's good to get something in the 40, 30, 50% range, but that's not really what you can run your business on. And so what's really required, and this is what takes time, is to tune the engine with labels data, with training mm -hmm. data. And of course, that's a whole other equation because you need a lot of domain to be able to label Mm -hmm. And you need a lot of data and, and a lot of wrangling of the data to be able to work through bias and size and comprehensiveness and a platform uh, that can make all of that happen. And that's where time gets lost. Mm -hmm. So the idea of pre-training accelerators is that you take a large horizontal engine, but you apply that to a specific problem and you design a cognitive engine that addresses a, a piece of the puzzle. So you think about, for instance, let's look at every large organization. They'll have an accounts payable department, and an accounts payable department fundamentally receives a number of invoices from lots of sources, uh, opens it, validates it, compares it to a purchase order perhaps, or a few of the documents, applies some business reason, reasoning to it, and then takes action on it. And if you took that entire accounts payable problem, this is departments of 800 people and a large Fortune 500 company to 1,000 people that are that are, that are essentially doing this uh, in multiple locations around the world. And you change that and you redefine that problem as, a, as an extraction, as mm -hmm. a classification, as a reasoning, and as a learning problem. Mm -hmm. And you say, how do I use AI to extract information off of a table or an invoice or even know that's an invoice or it's something else? How do I classify that into things that I'm going to act on and things I'm not mm -hmm. or things that need further review? How do you apply business reasoning associated with comparing it with other structured data and documents that can allow you to make a decision to pay or not pay? And then how do you apply learning, which is there a pattern over here? Is it the case that for this vendor, every time the invoice comes through, it's got the wrong sales tax on it because they think we're in the wrong state. And mm -hmm. so from that, what do we learn and how do we apply that back? So we change the definition of the problem into these, these four sort of cognitive elements. Then you see the starting point of these accelerators because we can design accelerators that are really good in extracting information from a piece of paper and classifying it as an invoice or not. We can design reasoning systems that can actually make the decision. We can design learning systems, and all of them have to be trained with labeled data. And so what we're really doing is we're building these accelerators by combining the power of large AI engines that we actually source from someone else uh, and the many that are available, but we train them. We train them with data that are labeled by using domain knowledge and an understanding of the business specific to that use case. We train them by running data that we find from that use case that is comprehensive, that is free of bias, that is well-managed and, uh, and, and accommodates for things like data drift and so forth for a period of time. Mm. And then we build these accelerators. And these accelerators then become the, the building blocks, right? So you can start with sand and clay and build a wall, or you can start with brick, Mm -hmm. that lay the foundation and build a wall. And I think that's the big difference we're finding when we ap apply accelerators as opposed to starting with, uh, with things uh, from the get-go. Mm, got it, got it. So we talked a lot about your strategy and some of the kind of high-level things, uh, thoughts on AI. I'd really like to dive in a little bit and hear about some of your specific uh, client work um, with you know, folks in pharmaceuticals or insurance. Uh, tell me some of the stories there. <laughs> 
well, you know, it's really exciting to see um, both the specifics and the breadth of AI application stories we're coming across in the work we're doing. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples just to sort of get you going. Um, you look in the insurance industry, we're doing a lot of work with, um, with providers that are actually in the processing of claim. So let's take an example of automobile. And if, you know, you've all been through a scenario where once in our lifetimes we had, unfortunately, some kind of a damage in our automobile. And you remember 20 years ago, we used to have to drive around to a, a, a distributor or or, 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 or authorized uh, place to get a, mm-hmm. you know, a, a claim and, you know, sort of an estimate done and so on and so forth. And now it's obviously the technology has moved and, you know, we're at a point where we can take photographs of those damages. And what we're doing is we're using... Uh, a convolution neural net and we're training it to be able to actually look at damaged car photographs and identify the mm. parts of the car that are damaged and the cost it takes to repair them. And obviously that's a lot of training data that goes into sort of making that happen. But what it fundamentally does is it changes the experience for a client. So think about the same scenario from 20 years ago and now you have the ability to either yourself or have um, sort of crowdsourced Uber-like service where someone pops into your driveway and it comes mm. by uh, from the neighborhood and just takes photographs. And and back on the back of that photograph, you know, we can make instantaneous decisions on both the size and the impact. You know, for instance, you need to tow the car away and it's a it's a throwaway or there's repair and and get quick estimates. So you can actually completely transform what it takes to actually service that client from a cost of delivery from a quality which is you know lost how do you manage a loss better and frankly from an experience yeah uh, for the for the client on the other end and so that's a great example in the insurance industry i'll give you another one in the pharmaceutical industry um which is all around adverse events i mean you know you and i've been in a situation where we've taken the late flight back from the other coast and had a glass of wine on the way and a couple of penicillins or whatever medication we might have been taking and the next morning i found myself with a blood donation facility and i happened to mention to a you know, the, the receptionist that had just this terrible headache and I had taken this penicillin or whatever medicine I'm taking and mm-hmm. this and that and the other. And the reality is that's an adverse event. If, you know, if, if he or she were to write that up and send it in, um, pharmaceutical companies are required by regulators to be able to acquire all that information and compile mm-hmm. and report it. And you can imagine there's tons of these kinds of adverse event information that are flowing around in the world as we all get very socially chatty and Facebook mm. and Messenger and doctor's notes and video transcript, audio transcripts and, and hospital and this and that and the alike. And so we're applying artificial intelligence to be able to ingest all of that info, information to be able to extract use, using natural language understanding the data and convert it into a structured file to make some fundamental decisions on whether it's an applicable uh, a, uh, adverse event or not. And mm. then be able to compile that into reports that obviously can be used as regulators. But more importantly, ultimately, give you very fast indication of, you know, important data points around drug safety. So these are really large, mm. purposeful sort of uh, users of AI that I think are going to transform the industry around us. I mean, you know, the other example that comes to mind is at the pharmacy. I mean, how many times have you and I shown up at a pharmacy to pick up a prescription that the doctors sent in, but you know, realize that it's just taking a long time. And mm-hmm. you know, next time that happens to you, you should think about what's happening. It's, it isn't that people are just sitting around, um, they are waiting for it. What's required is the doctor's instructions come in a format that is very different from what's going to be printed in the label mm-hmm. when you pick that medicine. And there's a process of converting it that mm. is very manual today. Oh, wow. And we're training neural nets to be able to take that off of medical catalogs and other information that can take the doctor's um, instructions and convert it into that packaging and the, the, the label oh. on the packaging that you'll ultimately get. Um, you know, in the... In the That's in the, huge. It, I don't want to be is, late waiting at a pharmacy for somebody to type up in some simple instructions. It's a, I'm sure they don't want to be doing it either. Well, that's, I mean, that's the point, right? I mean, it's, it's not just about cost of delivery. It isn't just about accuracy of the information. It is about experience of the consumer. Mm. And the reality is our thresholds have completely changed as consumers of, of, of anything. And, and being able to put AI into, predict, into very productive use cases that actually change the customer experience, that drive you know, long-term retention, that increase the quality, uh, that reduce the cost of delivery are just so important for pretty much any corporation we work with today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sanjay. I really enjoyed our conversation. I think our audience did as well. And... Uh, so if you're interested in hearing more, there are uh, further podcasts that we'll be doing around data and its role in the world. Thank you so much. 